Thank you. We are excited to welcome to Iowa and the Borlaug Dialogue a panel of truly distinguished guests with the commitment to the Dakar Declaration on Food Sovereignty and Resilience early this year further affirms Africa being at the forefront of harnessing change to transform global food systems. In this Des Moines to Dakar session, we are honored to have with us the president of Ethiopia, Salih Work Zudi, and vice president of Nigeria, Kashim Shatima. Leading this session is a true visionary. I would like to welcome back to Iowa our 2017 World Food Prize Laureate and President of the African Development Bank, Dr. Adesima. We celebrate his tireless and transformative work. Your Excellency, the President of Ethiopia, she's going to be joining us shortly, they're all backstage. Sally walks with it. Your Excellency, the Vice President of Nigeria, Kashim Shechima, the family of our great hero, Dr. Norman Bollock. Are they here? If you can see anybody in the, oh, hi, everybody. Yeah. The family of John Ruan III, may so rest in peace if you can see the Ruan family. They're here. Hi, very good to see you all. Uh, they endowed the Warfare Prize. Ambassador Terry Branstad, President of the Warfare Prize Foundation. Ambassador Kenneth Queen, Emeritus President, Eva F. Everson, uh, Warfare Prize Foundation. Warfare Prize laureates that are here, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Thank you all for joining us this morning for this session. I am delighted that the President of Ethiopia, High Excellency Sally Walk Swede, is joining us here today. She is an amazing leader who inspires us a lot in Africa. I'm equally delighted to welcome His Excellency Kashim Shatima, the, President, the Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, my own home country. But thank you for coming to Iowa and thank you for honoring our invitation. Your presence here today signals that Africa has the political will and is fully ready to tackle food insecurity and make hunger history in Africa. There is, of course, no better place where history is made in ending hunger than right here at the Warfield Prize. And there is no better place on earth for inspiration to end hunger than right here in Des Moines, Iowa, the bad place of Norman Bollock and the Norman Bollock Dialogue. And I know he's looking down for us and, uh, in heaven. It must be green where he is, and he must be happy today. A city where world leaders gather with one goal in mind, to feed the world. It is always good for me to be back in Iowa. Just six years, short years ago, I had the honor of being the recipient of the 2017 World Food Prize. It feels just like yesterday that I mounted the steps at the Iowa State Capitol. It was a day that further inspired me to continue to do all that I can to ensure that Africa achieves food security. I wish to use this opportunity to congratulate Heidi Kuhn for being the 2023 World Food Prize Laureate. Heidi, how, where are you, Heidi? Somewhere here? All right, please give it up to her, yeah. I commend you truly for your incredible and inspiring work. I welcome all of you to this event with a title From Dakar to, to Des Moines, organized by my institution, the African Development Bank Group. Now, which journey is, is this, you may rightly ask. Well, it is a journey of hope through the warm weather of Africa to sometimes cold weather of Iowa to share the progress that Africa 
African public and private leaders are making in decisively efforts to feed the continent and to transform Africa's agro-industrial sector. A story of how African political leaders, and you'll be hearing from them shortly, are taking decisive actions to feed the continent. It is also a journey and a narrative of how we are combining the power of science, technologies, policies, and politics to ensure that Africa fully unlocks its agricultural potential and feeds itself, and I must say, do so with pride. The title, From Dakar 2 to Demon Iowa, Iowa, stems from the outcomes of the action-driven African Food Summit that the African Development Bank and the government of Senegal, together with the African Union, co-hosted in Dakar, Senegal, in January of this year. We called it Feed Africa, Food Sovereignty and Resilience Summit, or simply put, Dakar 2 Summit. The summit was organized by us, but attended by world leaders, including 34 African heads of state and government, the president of Ireland, over 75 ministers of agriculture, finance and development, central bank governors, and 12 heads of multilateral and bilateral development organizations. While much progress has been made in African agriculture, 283 million people still go to bed hungry in Africa, about a third of the 828 million people that suffer hunger globally. At the Dakar 2 summit, we heard from African leaders that now is the time to feed Africa, that it was time that we start strategically talking about how to get Africa, which has 65% of the uncultivable, uncultivatable arable land left in the world to feed the world. It was time to raise our ambition. It is a call echoed by no other than US President Joe Biden, who said at the US-Africa summit that Africa has significant unused arable farmland that can be used to transform the continent's agricultural sector and food system. And President Biden went on further to say, Africa has the potential to feed its people and also to help feed the world. I school right here in the United States of America, went to good old Purdue University in West Lafayette, Indiana. Some food folks are probably here. But I can tell you I've never had a US president make that statement, Africa has the potential to feed its people and also help feed the world. Let's give it all to the president. Thank you, President Biden. Unlocking Africa's agricultural potential is at the core of the African Development Bank's Feed Africa strategy, which was actually launched here. You remember Ambassador uh, uh, Quinn. Since we launched our Feed Africa strategy in 2016, along with several partners, we have supported over 250 million people to benefit from investments, improvements in agriculture. At the core of our work is ensuring that we take technologies to the farmers. As Norman Bollock always admonished us, he said, take it to the farmers. And we are doing so now at an unprecedented scale. The African Development Bank's flagship program called Technologies for African Agricultural Transformation, or simply put TAAT, has brought together the International Agricultural Research Centers of the CGIR, national and regional research centers, seed and fertilizer companies, and agribusinesses to deliver climate resilient agricultural technologies at scale. In just four years, the TAT platform delivered heat-tolerant wheat varieties, drought-tolerant maize varieties, and high-yielding rice varieties to 12 million farmers, and increased food production by an additional 25 million metric tons. Working in close partnership with the CGIR, TART is helping to create regional public goods to tackle hunger and malnutrition. And it is quite an amazing work that we are doing together with the CGIAR. 
In just four years, if you look at the work that has been done, TAT's regional approach to technology transfer by harmonizing national and regional regulations in seeds and other farm inputs has meant a faster spread of technologies across agroecological zones and national boundaries. Of course, insects don't take visas, they don't take passports, and diseases don't take, go to an embassy to take visas. They go across agroecological zones. And what this does is, when you test a technology in one location, you should be able, and now you'll be able, to make it flow horizontally across the agroecological zones. We've never had that before in Africa. In other words, technology is tested in one location, can move freely across agroecological agro bands, and can now be released at all countries sharing the same horizontal agroecological zones. In short, these are technologies without borders. Results have been astounding. When drought hit the Southern Africa region in 2019, TAT came to the rescue. It deployed water efficient and drought around maize varieties that came, of course, from the CGIR, which were cultivated by 5.2 million farmers on 841,000 hectares. As a result, farmers survived the severe drought in Zambia, Zimbabwe, and Malawi. In Ethiopia, and we'll soon see Your Excellency, the President, TAT distributed more than 100,000 tons of certified seeds of heat-tolerant wheat varieties. It expanded wheat cultivated area under irrigated lowlands from less than 5,000 hectares when it was all started in 2018 to 1.4 million hectares in 2022 and 2023. Wheat yields doubled from two tons per hectare to four tons per hectare. Ethiopia's wheat production increased by an additional 1.6 million metric tons in 2023. And I am, of course, so delighted to say that today it has made Ethiopia self-sufficient in wheat for the first time in its history. And it became an exporter of wheat to neighboring countries. TAT is also boosting rice production. New high-yielding rice varieties from the program has been cultivated on 1.4 million hectares impacting 3.2 million households. Now, this unprecedented progress was challenged by the Russian war in Ukraine, which posed risks to efforts to achieve food security in Africa due to dependence of many countries on wheat and, and, and maize imports from these countries, as well as fertilizers, all of which had increased in prices because of the war. The African Development Bank responded very swiftly to mitigate the effects on Africa by rolling out a $1.5 billion African Emergency Food Production Facility. We also got additional support from the United States of America, from Japan, from Norway, from Germany and Netherlands. I said at the time that Africa should not go around with bowls in hand begging for food. Africa should fill those bowls with seeds and plant the seed by itself and be able to feed itself and come out of this particular shock. This initiative is a comprehensive one to help smallholder farmers to replace a shortfall of 30 million metric tons of food imported from Russia and Ukraine, especially wheat and maize. There, friends, the facility is now providing 20 million African smallholders with climate smart certified seeds and fertilizers over the next 24 months. It is supporting them to produce 38 million metric tons of food, and that will be valued $12 billion, and that is 8 million metric tons of food, more than the 30 million metric tons of food that Africa will lose from uh, its import uh, from Russia and from Ukraine. Now, we needed to harness this change and do more. And therefore, as leaders gathered for the Dakar 2 summit, we were convinced that we now have the technologies to feed Africa completely. And since then, we have achieved incredible results. What is now needed is continued strong political will 
to decisively take the successes all across Africa and to fully unlock the continent's agricultural potential. Therefore, 34 heads of state and government did not come to Dakar with prepared speeches. They spoke from their hearts. And one of them said, we must remove the shame that Africa is unable to feed itself. It was such an inspiring moment, and one that I'm sure that our great hero, Norman Bolog, will have been so happy to witness in the same manner that he witnessed the landmark Africa Fertilizer Summit in 2006 in Abuja in Nigeria. A major outcome of Dakar II was the endorsement of what's called Country Food and Agriculture Delivery Compact, which provided action and outcome-driven plans to ensure that food security will be attained and to unlock agricultural potential in Africa within five years. We are mobilizing internal and external financing to implement these food and agricultural delivery compacts. And so I am delighted to share with you today that at Dakar 2, the development partners announced right there more than $30 billion to support the implementation of the Food and Agriculture Delivery Compacts. The Afghan Development Bank itself would provide $10 billion over the next five years. Of course, things got better after the summit. Other development partners, many of them are here today, have joined in with further commitments, bringing the total support to over 70 billion US dollars, an unprecedented global effort ever in Africa. And so as we roll out actions from Dakar to our country levels, we are also pushing regional operations to boost food production. Building on the success, successes of TAT, we are now rolling out what's called Regional West Africa Rice Development Program, or REWORD, a $650 million regional operation across 15 countries. It will help to increase rice production in West Africa by 7 million tons of milled rice per year by 2027, an increase of 40%. Similarly, through the, what we call the Climate Adapted Wheat for Africa program, a $100 million regional operation, we will increase and expand wheat production and trade on the African continent by 10 million metric tons per year, also an increase of 40%. This will be delivered, of course, through the doubling of productivity of off-season irrigated wheat on 2 million hectares of lowlands of East and Southern and Sahelian Africa. At the core of the food and agriculture delivery compacts from Dakar too, is the development of what we call special agro-industrial processing zones, or simply put, SAPZs. We are investing heavily in the development of these SAPZs to support the development of agricultural value chains, food processing, value addition, and enable infra a limited infrastructure and logistics to promote local, regional, and international trade in food. And yesterday, Ambassador Queen was with us, Ambassador Branstad, where we had a fantastic event on this as a side event yesterday. The African Development Bank Group is investing $853 million in the development of these special agro-industrial processing zones. And it has mobilized an additional co-financing of $661 million for a total commitment of $1.5 billion. We are deploying effective partnerships at scale. We are currently implementing 25 special agro-industrial processing zones in 13 countries. And we have several of the partners here today, this morning. For example, the African Development Bank, the Islamic Development Bank, and the International Fund for Agricultural Development, IFAD, provided $520 million for the development of eight special agro-industrial processing zones in Nigeria. The second phase of that program aims to mobilize an additional $1 billion to develop special agro-industrial processing zones for 24 additional states in Nigeria. 
And in Ethiopia, we will hear shortly from our excellence of the President, the African Development Bank, the European Union, the Korean Exim Bank, and the Arab Bank for Economic Development in Africa are investing $198 million in the development of integrated agro-industrial parks. And a lot has been done to mobilize financing for businesses, especially small and medium-sized agribusinesses. The recent launch of the $100 million first loss by the USAID and NORAD of Norway, and I know Ambassador uh, Minister Tunivaran must be here somewhere, of Norway holds great potential to significantly de-risk equity investments for small and medium-sized uh, agribusinesses, and we work together with Secretary Yellen and um, also with Ambassador Power, the U.S. Administrator of USAID together in New York when they launched this. And also the $85 million agri-SME financing mechanism supported by the government of Canada at the African Development Bank, which was launched at Dakar 2 Summit, will provide affordable blended finance in terms of debt, and technical assistance to small and medium-sized agribusinesses. Ladies and gentlemen, friends of agriculture, there is great momentum now in Africa. Dakar 2 to Des Moines today sends a clear and unmistakable global message that African agriculture is changing rapidly and offers huge opportunities for investors. The size of the food and agribusiness in Africa will reach a whopping $1 trillion by 2030. So invest in African agriculture and agribusiness. The political will is strong. The results on the ground show huge promise. Let's collectively seize the moment. Let's feed Africa. And by so doing, let's feed the world. Thank you all very much. It's good to be here. Thank you. It's wheat harvest time in Ethiopia's Awash region. The yield is looking more promising than ever for farmers like Chautu Kebede using specialized wheat seed varieties more tolerant to the heat. In the past, productivity of the land was very low due to the flooding of the river. But this year, I'm very excited about the wheat crop. I expect a yield of 4.5 to 5 tons per hectare. Kebede's wheat crop is part of a 1.4 million hectare of lowland irrigated wheat program that Ethiopia started with the support of the Technologies for African Agricultural Transformation Program, or TART. Operating across nine food commodities in more than 30 countries, TART is helping Africa build back better. Next door in Sudan, TART's climate smart seeds are thriving. Sudan has just recorded its largest wheat harvest ever, 1.1 million tons of wheat in the 2019-2020 season. In Sudan and Ethiopia, hundreds of thousands of farmers now plant heat-tolerant wheat varieties that are rapidly boosting food security. TART is helping national economies create jobs, increase food security, and reduce food imports while improving the quality of life for millions of Africans. Good morning. Oh, I think we've had a lot more coffee than that. Good morning. morning. Now that sounds better. That sounds like Des Moines. My name is Victor Oladukun, and it's my honor and privilege to MC the rest of this program. And you're really in for a treat. But I'd like to, first of all, thank Dr. Adishina for getting the ball rolling this morning and for providing us with what really truly is a visionary tour de force of what has transpired since Dakar II leading up to Des Moines. As a global thought leader who does not take no for an answer and who in many circles is described as Africa's optimist in, ch in chief, 
it really is to Dr. Adishna's credit that he continues to shape Africa's strategic food agenda, galvanize global leaders, crowd in unprecedented resource commitments into the continent's agro-industrial space, push the envelope on what's possible, and co-shape the future of Africa's development. Well, we're going to segue right now into back-to-back -back fireside discussions with two eminent African leaders. Joining Dr. Adishna will be one of Africa's most distinguished leaders and a champion of women's rights. She has the distinction of being one of only two women presidents in Africa. Please welcome Her Excellency Sally Wogsworthy, President of the Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia, as she joins Dr. Akiomi Adishna on the program. Please give them a warm round of applause as they come on stage. Thank you all very much. <coughs> president Sally Wok Zwide. Uh, I, I, you're the president of Ethiopia, but you're famously known to me as my dear big sister. And uh, you're one of, Af of Africa's foremost leaders. And you are also the first female president of uh, Ethiopia. And you are one of the two presidents we have uh, female presidents in Africa. The other is your sister, uh, President uh, uh, Samia uh, Asulu uh, of, uh, of Tanzania. And actually, ladies and gentlemen, just yesterday was uh, Our Excellency President um, uh, uh, Swede, uh fifth year as president uh, in Ethiopia. Please, please give it up to her for... <laughs> And, 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 and their big sister, you, you, you have a whole range of things. You serve as ambassador for several countries. You've been at the UN at topmost levels um, in various parts of the United Nations. And you were named by Forbes as one of the world's uh, 100 most powerful women. Wow, I, I love that. Uh, <laughs> so you've seen it all uh, uh, from the national level to the global level. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So tell us, uh, Madam President, uh, wh why is it? What's that drives you? What's, what's the importance of political will, I guess, in tackling food security issues um, in Africa and globally? Okay. Thank you very much, uh, President Adeshina. Uh, first of all, let me tell you how happy I am to be here in Iowa. I have to confess that uh, I never expected uh, uh, to be somewhere and talk about food security and so on and so forth. As the president said, my area of competence has been diplomacy. That's where I have worked. Of course, it doesn't exclude these topics, obviously. But um, it's a, a, a totally different uh, place. So I'm really, really happy to be here. And thank you very much for the, uh, uh, for the invitation. Uh, I must say that. Um, uh, you know, with my gray hair, I have seen a lot, <laughs> but I can, uh, I think... For every single one of them, I guess. <laughs> uh, we, we have uh, come a long way in terms of uh, uh, where we want to go uh, as a continent. I have been listening, sitting behind about the Dakar 2 summit that you talked and so on. And uh, there is a big shift in the way we do business on, on, on this continent in Dakar summit has proven it. Uh, it was held in January and in February the uh, African Union heads of states and government assembly has adopted it. So it's a blueprint of the, of, uh, of the African Union. What uh, led us to, to this is, as you said, a political will. For time immemorial, this area has 
uh, not been given due attention. Agriculture. When at the, on the other side we have uh, the huge uh, part of our population, uh, uh, you know, living of it. Uh, Mr. President, it's a huge change of, um, of, of mindset that we are we're seeing unfolding on the continent, that uh, we cannot go far if uh, we don't uh, unleash the whole potential. Africa has been portrayed as a very rich country, and rightly so, in terms of resources, in terms of arable land that you have, fertile land that you have, and so on, that we have not used. So. Now this equation of rich country in terms of resources and, and yet poor people has to change, obviously. It will be difficult, in fact, to explain to the coming generations, our generations in Africa, that this is the status quo. So uh, I think this is uh, what has led to, 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 to this situation. And second, really, I don't know if it's the second or third, um, uh, the, the, you, you mentioned, I was listening to your wonderful and uh, presentation that you made earlier about what the bank is doing, what we are doing in Africa. In fact, you, you, ans you, you have answered some of the questions you might ask me. Uh, but, um, you know, I, I think we have to wake up from where we are. We cannot uh, suffer of food shortages fertilizers that we cannot get and so on, because there is trouble somewhere in the world. Uh, that self-sufficiency is becoming not only a necessity, but really an obligation if we want to, to, to move forward. But that obligation has been now adopted. All member states uh, are committed to it. It's our continental organization's program. So uh, political will, as uh, you, you have mentioned, is, is, is central to all this. Uh, daring to go that way, uh, to try to see what is it that we can get. And um, maybe I'll say it later when if you ask me that it is possible to do it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please thank Our Excellency for that very thoughtful. Um. <laughs> and Madam President, there, there's such a much buzz about uh, Ethiopia with regard to its wheat revolution, which I mentioned also in my uh, opening address. And what do you consider to be the keys to the success that, uh, that you have with, with this? And I remember when I met with Prime Minister Abe in, uh, in Paris when we were there together uh, with President Macron. Mm -hmm. And I walked up to him and I said, well, Mr. Prime Minister, congratulations. You are now at 1.4 million hectares uh, in, in heat tolerant varieties uh, in Ethiopia. And I said, well, Akin, um, we're now at two million. So I said, Mr. Prime Minister, warn me ahead of time so that I, <laughs> the speed at which you're going is so, is so remarkable so that I can get my numbers right next time. But what's been behind this? What's driving this? What's, what's the key to this success and what can other African countries learn from it? Yeah. First of all, it's, um, as, you, as we said earlier, it's a political will. Second is to really identify what is it that we can do um, to, to address uh, the, the issues that uh, we have at hand. Um, <clears throat> you know, Ethiopia has suffered in uh, its history of, uh, of uh, um, food insecurity, but the most severe form of it, famine. Uh, and we didn't find the right way to, go, to make uh, uh, this uh, food insecurity really history. So that has been lingering in the mind of um, many leaders uh, since that time. Now it's to identify uh, what is it that is now uh, the crop that will be definitely used for our domestic consumption and uh, who it appears to be uh, one of the stable, f uh, you know, uh, foods that is, um, um, uh, you know, growing, the demand is growing internally. Uh, and uh, that can be produced in, in, in many areas. And um, between two seasons of uh, harvesting of other crops. So instead of having unused land waiting for the next rainy season to harvest, 
uh, that was possible to do it. So, uh, uh, moving from there, um, we have uh, had, uh, you know, the production of, uh, as you said, uh, heat-resistant uh, wheat varieties, uh, which has been distributed to our um, smallholder farmers, millions of them. And, you know, the land tenure in, in Ethiopia is also one of the challenges that we have. But the system of uh, um, using the land uh, in, in the form of cluster coming together to harvest has in increased the productivity tremendously. And uh, that uh, wheat revolution, really, if this is what has happened, um, was possible definitely because of that. And it has shown that transforming agriculture in that magnitude is indeed possible. Oh. And of course, irrigation, you mentioned mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. in, in less than five years, we moved from 5,000 hectares to 1.4, and the plan is to increase by 37%, but to, to reach, you told, he told you two, but uh, five million now is the target by Fantastic, well, thank you very much, that's good. That's <laughs> um, <laughs> One of the other things that really uh, Ethiopia is renowned for is the, what's going on with the agro-industrial parks that you have. Uh, I've visited quite a number of them, and, and again, this is helping you to diversify your economy to earn mm. more foreign exchange. Again, there's this phenomenal development for Ethiopia. What's, what's again, what are the lessons and, 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 and what's been your experiences with these agro-industrial parks? You, you spoke yesterday at the, at the session yes. uh, on special agro-industrial uh, processing zones, uh, so passionately about this. Yes, um, currently we have four of them, uh, pilot bases, and I think 20 uh, regional transformation centers. Because at the end of the day, producing is not enough. We produce coffee, for instance, but we don't process it. Now we have started to do that instead of exporting the raw material that we have. This is, the, the, again, a, a change of mindset. Raw, the raw should not be exported. We have to add value and process it uh, at home. So this is what we are. And um, you know, uh, producing food by itself cannot make us food sufficient if you don't have market in it. So the market is very important. That's why the processing, um, uh, you know, uh, of 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 our of our um, uh, products will be extremely important. That's why we have this. It adds value, but it creates also jobs. Mm. And I must also emphasize on the fact that from the industrial zone that I have myself visited, uh, the majority of the workers are women, young yeah. women. Uh, who really benefit from it. And uh, there is now a great consciousness among Ethiopians that producing is not enough. Mm. If, there is no, if there is no market, then that's where you don't, I mean, you cannot find, um, you know, uh, products and nutritious uh, 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 products on, on the table. Market is very important. This is what brings uh, um, the, the added value of having these uh, uh, agro-industrial parks, integrated agro-industrial parks. It's, um, it's new mm -hmm. to Ethiopia. Uh, I remember at the beginning there was some resistance, not knowing exactly what it would mean. But later on we have seen how it has attracted, you know, uh, many were coming to have a, a part of the shade. And uh, it's definitely promising. Uh, the, the plan is to increase, but um, we have to see um, the, the, the result with these four agro-industrial uh, parks. I know uh, in, in both with production and this, I must uh, say that um, the bank that you are so ably leading has been with us, uh, supporting us, and this is very important. By the way, since I'm sitting here, none of this would be possible if there is no finance, that's where we need this partnership, investment in, in those areas. The door is open, not only in Ethiopia, but the whole Africa, uh, where we can partner with, uh, uh, you know, uh, diversify our partnership 
and uh, the main driving force will be the interests of the country, of course, we, and we can have win-win uh, solutions to that. So uh, really it's just to invite you um, to look towards Africa. The president has said earlier, now the world has acknowledged the fact that, uh, in fact, this continent can feed the world. Uh, for so long, uh, the resources were extracted and so on, not knowing exactly to what use, in, in fact, not benefiting the population. Now, uh, it's, it's the reverse, so. Thank you very much, uh, Madam President. Well, you know, the, the thing that, as you go around Africa, you see that agriculture is really run by, by women, mm -hmm. um, and they are the core of it. And as I always say, I'm very passionate about women in leadership, and so that's why your leadership is very inspiring for me and many others. And I, I think if women were around the world, the world would be a more peaceful place and more better place. And so, I do um, disagree. I, I, I think so, but that's. Uh, um, but I, but I do want to say that uh, for agriculture, what's what's the what can we do to improve? Uh, the situation and conditions of women who actually run agriculture on our continent. Hmm. Women in, in Ethiopia, as well as in Africa, constitute more than 50% of the population. There is no empowerment of women, um, gender equality of women on our continent if we don't have the rural, the, the women in agriculture feeding the countries, feeding the continent. Women in, in agriculture, as you know, in, in our countries, are um, harvesting, processing, selling on markets, and so you find them all along that chain. So us sitting in the cities cannot talk of empowerment if we don't have those women with us. Uh, th that's, that's very important. Allow me really to, to, to go even further. I think we have to use, you know, you, you, you're helping us with the TAT, yeah. and the technologies for this. Technology is very, is very important. But uh, rural area areas are not that remote anymore. Of course, we need roads, access, but without it, we can directly reach the population through satellite. You know, just a small tablet. Uh, with no connection needed, but inform the woman how she can improve what she is doing. If she is illiterate, you talk to her. If she is literate, you write to her. She reads it. She knows how to do. I'm sure that our continent will rise and really rise up very quickly if we empower those women who are doing the job, but giving them more importance. Uh, more tools, more skills, uh, so that um, by doing so, by empowering them, we are all empowered. You, you said earlier that we are only two presidents on the continent. We are not doing well. That's for sure. I mean, yeah, I'm very proud to be one of them, but uh, I'm very much ashamed to be lonely in that, uh, to be only two. We, it has to change, so it's, this mindset has to definitely apply at all levels. And one of the good things about whenever you try a meeting is, so whatever is, you say all in favor, say aye. Um, <laughs> we need more women presidents in Africa, all in favor, say aye. Aye. Oh, the ayes have it, as I say. <laughs> <laughs> now, in closing, uh, Madam President, um, you know, on a more personal note, um, w what is it that motivates you personally from your heart about tackling food insecurity. Yeah, so you, you're getting me back to my early years, which is very far away now. I am from Ethiopia, a country that has suffered. I belong to that generation who has seen the suffering of our population, of the very abject, repeated famine because of land degradation and so on and so forth. And it has even taken a political uh, dimension. We had a revolution, etc. It has been at the core of the transformation of, uh, of, of the country. I uh, always thought that the primary task has to be able 
to meet the demand of our population. And uh, to do so, how re can we really use all our resources to feed the population? Mm -hmm. Now with the wheat, we were able to export, as you have said. But first of all, it's, demanding, it's um, meeting the demands which uh, we, are, we are doing. That really motivates me. There is no progress, total progress, if um, we have a um, hungry population in our, uh, in our midst. That's very important. So this is what uh, has been driving me, whether as an ambassador with the UN and so on, this has always been not at the back of my mind, really at the front. Right front. Of what I mean. well, thank you very much, Madam President. Uh, change of mindset cannot go far if we don't unleash our potential. We must wake up. Self-sufficiency is not a necessity, but an obligation. With success, political will, critical clustering of farmers, the importance of value addition in industrializing agriculture, no agriculture without women, and Africa will rise if we empower women. Your Excellency, thank you very much for sharing your thoughts with us. It thank you very good. much. And uh, before we, before, please, yes. Uh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Uh, she, she, she's an incredible leader. Uh, and uh, I wonder if Gebisa is here. Oh. Gebisa Ejeta, is he here somewhere? Where is Gebisa? Yeah, tall statured variety. Come, please come right up here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, is there a problem for the cameraman? Which one? Which height? Gebisa, please, please come right up. Wonderful. Um, Gebisa is uh, from uh, Ethiopia. Uh, we're going to get Gebisa up. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Wonderful surprise. <laughs> yeah, sorry to spring that on you, uh, big bro, but I. <laughs> he didn't see coming, so. <laughs> There's no way of coming. We can't see the public very well. Mm. It's a full room, I see. You know, um, you all know that uh, Gabisa is my big brother and, 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 and also a Warford Prize uh, a winner, but he was just decorated by uh, President uh, Joe Biden uh, with the Presidential Medal of Honor for Science, uh, which is incredible. And, um, and so, um, I was saying about Gabisha, he's a plant breeder, and he has a way of breeding himself very tall, and the rest of us are very short. Uh, but I thought just to be on stage and be together with our excellency, um, you know, it's, it's very important. So uh, thank you very much. We'll just take a picture with you, and then we got to get to Vice President. Right. Yeah, no, we, he's not speaking, so that's why. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you can say thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you all. Madam President. Yes, you can exit stage left. Once again, kind of give a very, very warm round of applause to President Sally Walkers-Weddy. Thank you, Your Excellency. What an amazing journey and testimony of political will, visionary leadership, and agricultural transformation in our own time. And congratulations, Dr. Gabisa, on a very well-deserved national award. Well, this morning, it's also a privilege to have with us His Excellency Kashim Shetima, Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. He is a man of many distinctions, including banker, former senator, former executive governor of Borno State in northeastern Nigeria, 
but most importantly, with a PhD in agricultural economics, he is an unrepentant farmer and a literal son of the soil. Please give a very warm Des Moines welcome to Vice President Kashim Shatima and Dr. Adishna as they come on stage. Uh, Vice President uh, Shechima, my dear brother, uh, the Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, you are passionate about, about agriculture. You have been the governor of Bono State in northern Nigeria. Uh, you have been a senator of the Federal Republic of uh, Nigeria. Now you are Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. And most importantly, I think, um, you are an agricultural economist, so I'm a bit biased uh, towards you now because I'm an agricultural <laughs> economist. Um, but you can feel at home here in Des Moines, Iowa, which is the, the, the world of agriculture. So please feel at home here. So tell us, why is leadership and political will so critical in feeding Africa, in particular also for Nigeria? Well, leadership in every dispensation is absolutely essential. Not even in the area of peace in Africa, but even in the development of our continent. We are at the bottom of the economy rather fundamentally because of our inability to add value to our agricultural produce, be it rubber, be it cotton, be it copy, and the lack of political will and drive by the leadership to push forward the agricultural transformation of the African continent. There is a book gifted to me by John Comantoros, my very good friend, <laughs> How Asia Works by Joy Studwell. It chronicles the meteoric rise of Korea, a barren outcrop, completely devoid of natural resources, under the leadership of the late president, Park Chung-hee. Leadership, a nation holds or rises fundamentally due to the quality of leadership. And I must confess that right now, Africa is blessed with quite a handful of quality leaders that have the drive, that have the passion, that have the skill set to redefine the meaning and concept of modern leadership. Abiy Ahmed of Ethiopia is a case in point. Bola Ahmed Tinibu, my boss, is a good example. Maki Sal, and of course, Abdul Fattah al-Sisi of Egypt is doing wonderfully well, just to mention but a, a few of the African leaders that are acquitting themselves uh, very well. But I want to assure the gathering, a family gathering here, that my boss, President Bola Ahmed Tinibu, is a quintessential 21st century modern African leader who is determined to redefine the meaning and concept of modern leadership. Be rest assured that there will be a sea change in the fortunes of the Nigerian nation and by extension, the African continent in the next uh, couple of years, because fundamentally, Nigeria accounts for 50% of the population of West Africa and hosts 75% of its economy. So Nigeria is an anchor nation. <laughs> like you can mention Egypt with 100 million, Ethiopia with another 100 million, GDR, Democratic Republic of Congo, with 80 or 90 million, Nigeria with 225 million. If these nations walk to South Africa and Kenya and of course Ghana, Africa will walk. And this is our time to shine. Very good, our shine to shine. Good. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Vice President. Now, I remember when I was uh, Minister of Agriculture in Nigeria, 
you are then the executive governor on, uh, uh, in Bono State, and we introduced, uh, you have the, the Lake Chad Research Institute yes. in my degree, and uh, we introduced then the heat tolerant wheat varieties. Yes. Um, and, and in fact, to the Bollock family, this, w one of the varieties was actually named Norman Bollock. Uh, there was one of them called um, Antilla Ganantilla, the other one was called Namambalog. And that those varieties performed so well, and in fact the same varieties and many others that were then introduced to Ethiopia that led to that revolution that uh, we, we, we've just heard about from our Excellency uh, President uh, of Ethiopia. Uh, can you share with us, um, Nigeria is a big importer of, of wheat, um, and yet you have tremendous amount of land, and you have a policy for that. Can you share with us uh, what you plan to do on wheat, in particular also fitting up from the successes that you've seen uh, in Ethiopia? Well, our target towards wheat production in Nigeria, you know, as Susan Sontag said, good dependency conditions for the kinds of dependency. And so long as a nation is not independent of uh, production, it remains uh, a less independent nation. Our drive towards wheat production is to achieve 50% self-sufficiency in food production in the next three cycles. It is inconceivable that in the year 2021, we imported wheat worth $3.23 billion. We are the second largest importer of wheat in the world. Locally, I'm not playing to the gallery, I'm saying the fact. You are one of our pioneers. You are our own Norman Bollock, our own African Norman Bollock. The ADB of which you hit, the budget sector support of $134 million, which is part of the African Emergency Food Support Mechanism of the ADB, which we had access. We have already procured enough wheat tolerant, heat tolerant varieties of, uh, of wheat, and we are going to drive that process by obliging supporting the farmers with the heat tolerant varieties, agricultural extension services, and of course, fertilizer and wonderful agricultural practices. We hope to increase the irrigated area under cultivation to 500 to one million hectares in the next cropping cycle. We need to produce about 2.5 million tons of wheat grains in this country. And we are going to reach out to our farmers through small irrigation schemes, through digitalization, because we have an existing ICT portal that was used in 20 to 2016 when you were the Minister of Agriculture, when we witnessed the lowest inflation in food prices in, in Nigeria. Well, by the entire scope of agricultural activities from finance to access to inputs to market information will be obliged to the existing portal of farmers, all geared towards addressing our food emergency. And the world is changing. We are an interconnected world, but the volatilities in the world has truly expose us and be rest assured that all the actors in the value chain will be sufficiently taken care of uh, through innovative finance, through partial credit guarantees and crop insurance, so that at the end of the day it will be a win-win situation for the world. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Vice President. Um, on my flight here to the United States, I picked up uh, the Financial Times and, uh, for Tuesday, and that Financial Times had a screaming headline, the return of the rice crisis in the world. Um, and India has actually banned the export of, of rice, and there's a lot of concern that that's also going to happen uh, in Vietnam, in Thailand, and other things, and uh, that we may be witnessing, or we may actually witness again the kind of crisis we had with uh, food cri um, uh, rice crisis in 2008. We created global inflation and in fact led again to the uh, Arab Spring later and all of those things. But yet Nigeria has, uh, in this case again, just like wheat, where you say you're going to do 2.5 uh, million metric tons, a huge amount of 
capacity for, for rice, and production, and also to meal. So can you share with us uh, what your government's uh, plan is to continue to um, accelerate um, rice production in Nigeria? Well, the beauty of the rice quagmire we are in is that we have the milling capacity. We have 62 integrated rice mills across the nation. Our major challenge has to do with the paddy rice, the inadequate paddy rice, and we need to produce three to four million tons of paddy rice to meet our rice requirements of about 2.5 million tons per annum. The agricultural belt of the nation, we have 75 million hectares of arable land, and most of it is suited for rice cultivation. Along this line, we have already set up a team specifically devoted towards championing the cause of rice production. By supplying our farmers with certified seed, it's very crucial. Fertilizer, extension services, and of course the digitalization of our platform such that our farmers can have access to services, inputs, even finance and even market information will certainly facilitate our drive towards self-sufficiency in rice production. We are going to expand the land under rice cultivation. We have no option than to massively and aggressively embrace irrigation agriculture, especially in the uh, very rich river basins spread across the length and breadth of this nation. Uh, our target is to achieve self-sufficiency in rice, latest by 2027. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Vice President. Now, the, yesterday you were with um, High Excellency President of Ethiopia. Both of you uh, were fantastic. We were joined by Ambassador Queen and, 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 and several others talking about special agro-industrial processing zones. And I mentioned those in my, in my, uh, in my speech. And, and, and you are the core of it in Nigeria, because you have aid to start, and, and we're talking about how to expand that with mobilizing about a billion dollars for you. So share with us um, your vision um, about the special agro-industrial processing zones and how this can help to transform your economy. Thank you so much. The special agro-industrial zone was designed to create the enabling environment for aggressive private sector participation. Create the enabling environment for private sector to participate actually in the production and processing of Nigerian agricultural produce, thereby enhancing value to agricultural products, creating employment opportunities, and also addressing the issue of rural urban drift. Balu addition is, Your Excellency, absolutely mm -hmm. essential. We are at the bottom of the pyramid, fundamentally because we are net exporters of raw agricultural produce. The global coffee industry is worth $450 billion. The coffee producers from Colombia to Kenya to Rwanda to Uganda, what they get is around $20 billion. Germany, a non-coffee producer, earns about $45 billion from the coffee market. Our effort with the SAPZ is to create a system, an ecosystem, whereby the government will play a very least, a very minimal role. Mm -hmm. We'll only create the enable environment. And my boss, President Bola Ahmed Tinebu, has given the authorization for us to set up an SAPZ Zone Development Authority, Fantastic. all geared towards addressing the coordination. It's a one-stop shop where regulatory frameworks will be taken care of, where all the loopholes that might crop up, and it will be domiciled in my office. I will personally drive that process Good. to see that all the bottlenecks <laughs> are eliminated towards, because SAPZ is an industrial policy framework and also a policy aimed at the structural hmm. repositioning of the Nigerian economy. 
is going to be a game changer. And we have that moral obligation to see that all bottlenecks are eliminated, to see that Africa takes its pride of place in the Committee of Nations. I would rather be, I would rather seek for partners. We are not seeking grants or aids, no. We are seeking for partnership, for mutually beneficial relationships. It's my singular honor and privilege to invite our investors to come on board. And within the production clusters, we have what we call the agribusiness investment region, where that will provide the framework for our farmers to produce agricultural produce. Every infrastructure will be provided. Ambassador Queen was mentioning about Vietnam, a road <laughs> that provided a platform for enhanced agricultural production. So you're going to be, be hands-on on this and, exactly. uh, in your office. I, I like that, hands-on. OK, good. All right, as we close um, uh, this uh, fireside chat, uh, Mr. Vice President, uh, tell me, uh, what is it from your heart that uh, drives you, makes you feel you need to be able to deliver food security for Nigeria? What's, what's it on the inside of you? Where there is will, there is always a way. I believe that Nigeria is a great nation in chains. And I believe we have the skill set. Once we have the drive and the commitment and the passion to see that we have gotten our acts right. Ethiopia, we were able to get their acts right in the past couple of years. And I believe with the right leadership mix, especially under the current dispensation of President Bola Ahmed Tinibu, I think success is not a question, it's not a subject of dispute, but a question of time. I'm very passionate, so also is President Bola Ahmed Tinibu. And since you left the Ministry of Agriculture, we well, have never had a Minister of Agriculture who is as supremely competent as the one currently holding that portfolio. <laughs> so be rest assured that it's a matter of time. Thank you. There will be a paradigm shift in our attitudinal disposition as leaders, and, and Nigeria will be a better place for all of us. Mm -hmm. Nigerians are the most upwardly mobile immigrant community in the United States. If they can excel in the US, mm -hmm. why can't we excel at home? So I want to assure you, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, that Nigeria is open for business. Mm. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hands on. Where there's a will, there is a way. Drive and commitments. We need paradigm shift. Get our act right. Success. It's just about time, and time is ticking. Thank you very much, and thank you for joining us for this session. Excellency. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very proud of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ambassador. <laughs> A very well deserved round of applause indeed. Please be seated. This indeed has been a focused and fascinating session with excellent back-to-back -back firesides with President Zwiri and Vice President Shitima. Thank you for joining us here in Des Moines and for enriching this plenary session with your thoughts and with your ideas. Thank you also, Dr. Adishna, for moderating two excellent fireside chats. Kindly turn your attention to the screen for a brief tribute to a visionary leader who helped impact our world, Professor Gordon Conway, former president of Rockefeller Foundation. He was best known for his focus on sustainable agricultural development in Africa. Agricultural ecologist Sir Gordon Conway pursued a wide range of research interests. If you go anywhere in Africa, you can always get a Coca-Cola bottle or a Pepsi-Cola bottle, but you can't get a, a bag of seed or a bag of fertilizer. I was uh, extremely saddened to learn of the passing of my boss, uh, Sir Godon Conway. 
Um, I used to call him Chief. He was a chief to me all through his life, an incredible man. And we both had one thing in common, the passion for agriculture. Conway's contributions in research and policy for agriculture, food security and sustainable land management earned him leadership and academic positions and accolades worldwide building and sharing his expertise in food production in the Global South. Among his services to the development sector, he held positions as United Kingdom's chief scientist. He was also the vice chancellor of the University of Sussex and as president of the Rockefeller Foundation. Above all, he was an endearing boss. He hired me as an associate director and regional director for the Southern Africa office of the Rockefeller Foundation. Having got on Conway as a mentor at the Rockefeller Foundation influenced how I look at development issues today. God on Conway was such a visionary. He saw Africa's potential to be able to sustainably fit itself. Conway wrote books that influenced generations of agricultural researchers and policy. One of the messages of the book is that any technology can be appropriate. You need to put aside your prejudices about technologies. Conway also led the Agriculture for Impact program at Imperial College London. The program looked for ways to enhance agricultural development for smallholder farmers in sub-Saharan Africa. Into his 80s, Conway reached new audiences as a Malibu Montpellier panel senior advisor, spreading word of the organization's innovative solutions to Africa's food and nutrition challenges via social media. Much of his research and theories still resonate with us all today. But most importantly, it is his life, his humility, his sincerity, and his focus in making sure the poor are never excluded that I will never forget. May so rest in perfect peace. Professor Sir Gordon Richard Conway, agricultural ecologist, advocate for Africa, global humanitarian. A truly amazing leader, academic and development ambassador. In his life, he made an extraordinary difference. I know that Dr. Additioner would like to share very briefly and quickly, because we've almost run out of time, um, a few words about Professor Conway, who I know impacted your life tremendously. Dr. Additioner. Thank you very much, Victor. Today, the world of agriculture is less complete because we have lost Professor Gordon Conway, one of our finest agricultural scientists. Gordon was a larger-than-life agricultural scientist who pioneered landmark work in the area of agroecology. His book on doubly green revolution inspired all of us to think beyond productivity increases, but to produce more food in a sustainable manner, paying greater attention to the environment, biodiversity, and climate issues. He was my boss at the Rockefeller Foundation. In fact, he hired me in 1998 as a senior scientist for Africa and then as associate director for food security. I remember when I walked in New York um, and my wife and I moved to New York with our two kids. We went to a very, very small apartment in Manhattan. And our second kid was very concerned. He asked, Dad, where are the cars? I said, we don't have no cars here in New York. It said, we are, um, it's the garden. I said, that's Central Park. <laughs> and then he looked at his mother, and he said, Mama, are we poor now? <laughs> and we've never been richer, actually. And I told Gordon Conway about this, and then when Gordon Conway sent me to Harare to be the regional representative of the Rockefeller Foundation, he, we invited him to our home for dinner. And of course, in Harare, all the houses have big tennis courts and swimming pools and so on. And Gordon Conway repeated this to our son. He asked him, Shagun, how do you feel now? He said, I feel now like Bill Gates. <laughs> Gordon had so much humor. He was such a great inspiration. He was a man who cared so deeply about the poor, about the environment, about the youth, about diversity, about Africa. He worked tirelessly to build institutions and human capacity in Africa. I had the knowledge, I had the privilege of knowing and working with one of his students uh, from Imperial College, uh, Dr. Debussy Araba, which I'm sure is in the hall today, was also doing an amazing work and is with us today. So as we celebrate his passing, 
uh, with these kind words. Uh, let's remember and thank God and for inspiring us, for in helping to shape our vision, for sharing with us his incredible humility, humor, generosity, and kindness. I personally, like you, remember Gordon uh, today, and I will always remember him as he walked with, down the hall at the Capitol on 2017 when I received the Warford Prize, and he was so really happy. And I felt so proud of him because he was my boss, and I always called him chief. Thank you so much, Gordon, for sharing your incredible life and light with us. We greatly miss you, Gordon. Good night, Chief, and thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Adishina. We will now make a very quick transition into our panel discussion on U.S. public and private sector opportunities in African agriculture. We're truly exceptionally fortunate to have with us an excellent expert panel, so please join me in welcoming in this order, Ramin Tului, Assistant Secretary, Bureau of Economic and Business Affairs, U.S. Department of State. And as they come, come on stage, please give each one of them a round of applause. <laughs> Ramin Tului. <laughs> Dina Esposito, Assistant to the Administrator for the Bureau for Resilience, Environment and Food Security, USAID. John Kamantaros, Chairperson, Flower Mills of Nigeria. Stuart Knight, Global Commercial Operations Leader, Health and Agriculture, Thermo Fisher. And Jason Brantley, Vice President, Small Ag and Turf, John Dare. I'm going to keep, kick off our conversation in the order in which you've come on stage, so I'm going to start with you, Ramin. As you know, um, our discussions in Dakar mm -hmm. centered on how it is that Africa can achieve food sovereignty sustainably and the requirements of huge investments in finance in order to transform agricultural systems. What is it that your team is doing to make a difference. And as you listened to our leaders a few moments ago, what is it that you'd like to address from what it is that they've talked about? Sure, I'll speak uh, from the perspective of the And state. because we've run out of time, I'm gonna give each one of you two minutes to synthesize your thoughts with each of the questions. I'll be very tight. <laughs> um, Secretary Blinken has been very focused on this in his discussions with African leaders and uh, the U.S. Has, uh, has committed $14 billion just since the beginning of 2022 to address both the humanitarian needs uh, globally, uh, food insecurity, and also the development needs. And this is something that's been made very clear uh, in his discussions with African leaders that they appreciate this humanitarian support but really want to build stronger food systems for the future. Now, part of that is actually addressing issues in the food system. Uh, so our special envoy for food security, global food security, uh, Kerry Fowler, has pioneered a new initiative called the Vision for Adapted Soils and Crops that already on the ground, this planting season in Southern Africa, uh, has gotten into the hands of hundreds of thousands of farmers, drought-resistant cor drought corn, uh, to try to make the crops more resilient to the effects of this year's El Nino. Uh, and the idea is to scale that up, not only through adaptive seeds, but also mapping of soil in, uh, on the continent uh, to try to you know, make the agricultural systems more resilient. At the same time, you need to be able to get crops to market. So we also uh, have a, a, a very uh, intense focus on developing infrastructure in the continent. Just today, a memorandum of cooperation was signed, uh, including the governments of Zambia, a Democratic Republic of uh, Congo and Angola, uh, to promote a corridor uh, called the Libido Corridor in Southern Africa. Okay. And that comes after we've signed numerous uh, compacts through our Millennium Challenge Corporation this year. 
uh, including with uh, Kenya uh, and, and, and other continent countries on the continent to develop those infrastructure systems which are critical <coughs> to the development of the agriculture system. And I believe an MOU was signed yesterday. That's, uh, it was, I think, today, if I'm right, for the Libido Corridor. Absolutely. So yeah. congratulations on that a yes. major undertaking. I'm kind of going to come to Dina next. You were in Dakar. Right. And what an amazing event it was. You were also one of the panelists there. Just from a shared learning um, perspective, what is it that Feed the Future is doing to provide farmers uh, globally with technologies at scale in order to transform agriculture and improve productivity. I'll say a word about Feed the Future and then maybe highlight one particular initiative that's, I think, uh, relevant to the conversation we've just been hearing. Uh, but first, I want to just acknowledge the inflection point that Dakar really felt like, to hear so many heads of state standing up and recommitting to investing in agriculture to feed Africa and feed the world. And you heard it again here today on stage. And I think that it energy and urgency is, is really paralleled in what you're hearing U.S. government leaders. I can't think of another time when you've had the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Treasury, Administrator Power, uh, Secretary Vilsack, all in, the, in the, just in the last two months, if you, if you Google it, each one of them speaking out forcefully on all of these new investments that the U.S. government wants to make and is making to address global hunger. Now, Feed the Future is the flagship U.S. government global hunger initiative. It is led by administrator power, but it actually comprises 11 different agencies. The work that you're hearing about from Assistant Secretary Tului is, is part of Feed the Future. The McGovern Dole School feeding programs that USDA conducts are part of Feed the Future. And of course, USAID has a, a roughly $1 billion portfolio that it's investing in this goal of ending poverty, <clears throat> hunger, and malnutrition through a range of investments. And um, we are spending about half a billion dollars at USAID every year on the African continent before the emergency supplemental funds to drive inclusive, sustainable ag-led growth. It has a strong resilience focus, which means that we have to assume, we don't want to assume away risk like global shocks like climate shocks. We're actually saying, let's anticipate and address those risks. And that's why you're hearing about more investments in things like climate smart seeds and improved on farm production practices, why we're supporting the African Continental Free Trade Initiative to really make sure that local and regional markets are accessible and growing even as uh, global trade continues um, to thrive. And uh, the, la the initiative I wanted to mention reflects something that the vice president from Nigeria said, which he said, we don't want aid, you know, we want investment. And the small amount relative that AID puts out there um, to catalyze uh, private sector, commercial-led, <coughs> inclusive agriculture, really we see as catalytic, right? We want to use our money to incentivize private sector investment. And you heard President Adesina talk about the new fund that we launched at the UN General Assembly. It's called the Financing for Agriculture, Small and Medium Enterprises in Africa. We made a $70 million commitment. We're inviting others to join us in that commitment to get to $200 million, which in turn we expect to unlock hundreds of millions of private sector, private capital. What this is is a first loss fund to de-risk those investments so that um, small and medium enterprises, which are the backbone of the ag economy, can grow. Three of every four SMEs don't have access to the finance they need. Thank you so much, Dina. Uh, this is not politics here, but I just want to say a big thank you and give a, a, a serious shout out to the US government for very strong engagement with Africa in the area of infrastructure and agriculture over the last two and a half years. Excellent work going on. <clears throat> John, Flour Mills has been in Nigeria for over 63 years. I remember living not too far away from Flour Mills in the 1960s in Lagos, Nigeria. Um, you guys are engaged in various areas of the value chain in agriculture. Now, if you had a crystal ball, I know that this is, you know, uh, I, I think if, if I were to ask this question, I'd put it this way. If you had a crystal ball, because most of what we tend to hear about Nigeria is negative. There's a perception, an obtuse perception of risk. 
If you had a crystal ball and you could look down the road five to ten years from now, where do you think Nigeria's agriculture will be? Well, I think, Victor, that's an easy one. Uh, we need to double the yield and output of Nigerian agriculture in the next four years. We need to go from 22 million tons to 44 million tons. Population of Nigeria when we started in 1960 was 35 million people. Today it's 225 and going. So the doubling of, 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 of grains must be a, a, an absolute imperative. There's, there's no question about it. I think you, we've heard from the Vice President of Nigeria the sincere intent of, of, of going forward. And I think that's what is critical. We, we've got to use science and all the elements of government for enabling to really double yield. And that's through a variety of ways. It's number one, having you know, nutrients like the Montes and the below soil help. Uh, it's having a seed sector which is really vibrant and pr producing the best in class in the world seeds in Nigeria so that they're readily available. It's about having coordinating the extension services. It's about mechanization to the small scale uh, farmer. And it's about having uh, uh, crop yield <coughs> loss, not reducing that, which you have some, we have some bags that are no fly, you know, insect repellent and infrastructure. So it's about making more efficient throughout the entire agro value chain uh, so that the farmer gets a better yield, makes more profit, grows more, and the, the product that he produces is competitive for the industries that have to use it and the consumer that has to consume it because ultimately it is an integrated value chain. And I think you've, we've heard the serious intent of the Nigerian government to use science and all its efforts to double the yield and create this critical uh, move in agriculture. And I, I want to thank you for, for emphasizing the role of science. There are members of the African <coughs> Academy of Science here and lots of students who I believe are also in the scientific um, field here. Please make sure that you engage with John before he leaves because we do need you to help transform our agriculture. I'm going to come to Stuart next. Uh, Thermo Fisher, very unique organization. What is it that your company can do to bring value to the table for African um, investors as well as those engaged in the agriculture sector? Great. Well, thank you, Victor. And it's a, it's a real pleasure to be on this stage with this group and certainly uh, to represent the 130,000 Thermo Fisher employees operating in over 100 countries uh, and a big focus in Africa, uh, delivering uh, life-changing, game-changing solutions for some big challenges that face Africa every day. Uh, Thermo Fisher is, is unique in that we, we bring big, bold, uh, solutions to, to big problems. And certainly in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, we're, we're bringing technologies that are, are solving these problems, problems related to what John was just mentioning about bringing science and what uh, other dignitaries here have, have mentioned, bringing science to the problem, that the right technology is required to bring science to the problem. And it's not just a matter of bringing the technology, and Thermo Fisher's the leader in, in many of these technologies. And, most of you who work in a lab, you've got a Thermo Fisher solution, either in some or in, in, in quite a large number of solutions in your labs. But it's affordability, it's accessibility, it's the training and the workforce development behind what it takes to create the solutions that this technology uh, can enable. Uh, we're here to support that, we're here to make sure these these solutions are affordable in these very low resource environments. Uh, we are here to help train up the next generation of genomic scientists in Africa, the next uh, generation of, of scientists who are behind the next uh, big IP, the next big invention, uh, the next uh, big solution that will change the game for uh, global food security, regional food security, uh, how we're adapting uh, good breeding programs, uh, creating better yield for crops, better yield for livestock, uh, limiting the amount of resource it takes to uh, create this, this yield, et cetera. But it all boils down to the institutional and political will, the funding, uh, and certainly the, um, uh, 
the resources that sit in this room uh, from a funding standpoint and the partnerships uh, from a government standpoint, uh, the private sector uh, must be involved. Thermo Fisher is, depending on our stock price, we're a Fortune 50 company. There's only 49, typically 49 other companies that are more valuable than we are from a market st cap standpoint. We have a responsibility, as do other major companies, to invest in Africa, invest in other low resource company uh, environments, and we're certainly doing that each and every day. Uh, and that's, that's where we're focused on uh, providing that value proposition and these these new SAPZ zones are certainly provide some real synergies that we're are very interested in exploring. Very excited about that. So in short, it sounds like you're bullish on Africa. Very bullish. All right. Awesome. Now I'm going to come to Jason Brantley. Like Dr. Additioner, you are an alum of Purdue. So I'll say go boil, boil the makers. Absolutely. Um, and I'm sure for all the other Purdue um, alum here, the same goes out to you. Now, turning to the role of technology, um, the U.S. has always played a lead role in the area of technology, but it's changing fast in a very dynamic environment. What is it that's changing? What is it that we need to pay attention to? And what can your company bring to the table to help, tra to help transform agriculture on the African continent? Yeah, thanks for that question. And, and thanks for the opportunity to be here with this esteemed panel as well. You know, you can't talk about agriculture without talking about technology. They're very tightly intertwined. And, uh, and John, is really proud of the technologies that we've been able to develop and introduce around the world that are making meaningful changes in, in productivity, reduction in use of inputs, improved carbon efficiency, um, improved profitability for farmers. In fact, a lot of our Precision Act technologies um, are developed right here in Des Moines um, at one of our labs that are here. So we think a lot about technology, and when we look at Africa, we certainly see a range of technologies that are really necessary to help meet the developmental goals that, that we have. Uh, at, at one end, um, simply Im implementing mechanization and getting tractors in place is a significant technological step forward and opens up the opportunity for conservation tillage and regenerative ag practices that require mechanization and also gives a platform to build from. And at the other end, there's more advanced data and analytical technologies. The way that we're looking at, at managing and supporting this, and we implemented this back starting in 2016, is what we call our SMART campaign. So we focus, it's an acronym of course, large companies always use acronyms, so it's focused on solutions that are appropriate and designed for Africa, mechanizing for yield increase, access to finance, reliability, and technology. And so some of the steps that we've taken with that are trainings around basic technologies and more advanced technology. We've made a commitment that we're gonna integrate telematics into all of the self-propelled equipment that we sell in Africa by 2026. That'll create an IoT fleet of equipment that can run apps and transmit data and document uh, over time to be able to do things like help manage carbon and also manage inputs and productivity. And we've also partnered with Hello Tractor, who provides a software as a service that helps contractors and small farmers get matched up to provide the right services at the right time with transparent pricing and reliability. And we're really excited about that partnership. So I think these initial steps have gone really well and it's caused us to think there's a lot more that can be done in terms of transferring a lot of technologies into Africa as we build out this platform. Awesome, thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna to come to Stuart next. Um, what does Thermo Fisher see as some of the most significant opportunities available on the continent right now? Well, I think uh, local, local manufacturing and food sovereignty, you know, this, whole, this whole notion of controlling your domain, uh, having the resource to uh, not only uh, feed your cells and create the uh, the, the supply, but enough to also export. Uh, we have a, a major initiative that we're launching across a number of industries, supporting local manufacturing, the quality processes involved there, uh, pathogen detection in the food supply, uh, creating the trust and the regulatory uh, environment, uh, supporting the regulatory environment required for uh, that that trust and the the oversight required for that for that level of, of industry, uh, and we're certainly eager to support that in the future. Thank you, and I'm gonna jump, John, for just a second and come to Dina just as a follow-up on that. Again, um, as we said earlier, you were um, in Dakar, and one of the big discussions then was about 
Uh, the challenges we have accessing fertilizer, the yeah. costs of which are highly prohibitive, more so after the Russian war in Ukraine. We know what, you know what that means for farmers. So what is it that you're doing um, in terms of supporting SMEs in the agri-space, particularly in the area of fertilizer? Great. Um, I wanted to just pick up on something that Assistant Secretary Tuluy said, which was that the U.S. gave roughly $14 billion in response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine to respond to the global food crisis. Quite extraordinarily, a billion dollars of that was provided in development money to go, uh, most of it, through the Feed the Future development platform in some 40 countries around the world. And this approach of thinking about development and market systems and sustaining those market systems, not just doing the relief to the most vulnerable directly to households, but thinking about the system, was really quite a moment. And I think it's um, hopefully one we can encourage uh, in the future. And I think the American people can be extremely proud of the speed um, and size of the response that the US government gave. On fertilizer, there are a couple things that we did. The first was we partnered with um, fertilizer companies who were interested in providing discounted fertilizer on the African continent. And we connected them with our aid missions and our last mile partners to get that out. There was a very unique consortium of public-private partners that came together under something called Sustain Africa. And that initiative was pooling all of those uh, donated or discounted uh, resources and providing extension services um, to get them out to over a million and a half farmers <clears throat> in seven different countries. We did a lot on the financing side, as you, as you mentioned, so that agro-dealers could have access to this supply even though it was scarce. We um, launched in partnership with the DFC and the Gates Foundation a first loss fund, um, a fertilizer guarantee fund that will unlock $360 million in fertilizer sales in Kenya, Zambia, and Ghana. Um, and this is facilitating sales from fertilizer companies to the agro-dealers to get the agro-dealers, uh, keep them in business, and keep farmers having access to that fertilizer. A similar initiative, we provided $15 million to the African Development Bank um, through the uh, emergency response food production facility, which you heard about uh, from President Adesina. All that said, the last point, fertilizer, production and availability and access are not the only issues. I think what the crisis revealed, that there's also a use efficiency and soil nutrient issue. And this is the investments that, um, uh, that we've been speaking about as well. Thank you, Dina Esposito. I'm gonna come back to John. What are some of the factors that either inhibit or facilitate growth in the agricultural sector in Africa at the moment? Um, well, I think that's a great question. Um, if we look at, I think you have to compare, you know, Nigeria with Ethiopia and Asia. Why has Ethiopia achieved such great success? Why has Asia achieved such great, great, great success? And I think it's looking at those models and seeing how, how do we become best in class in each section of that value chain? In other words, it, understanding what does the soil have? What nutrients does the soil need? How do we build a local seed proliferation, you know, uh, sector? And, and there, um, I, I'm not talking about GMO. I, I think the hybrid is what we need in, in Nigeria for this purpose. And when I say science, I mean really finding the best in class methods for doing what we're doing. And extension services. We have Dr. Marco Quinones, who is a, a mentee of Norman Borlaug in Nigeria with three Ethiopians, looking to how they're going to double yield in wheat, maize, soybean. And how do we link that with the extension services that are available, with the agronomists that are available at the state and federal level? How do we link that to really make the, the desired impact? And all through the value chain, how do we get best in class? How do we use our, our minds to get best in an organization and our purpose to get best in class in each section so that the farmer can double his yield, make a lot of money, and the out output is actually competitive with where, anywhere else in the world? That, that I think, is the key the key thing, really focusing on how we optimize each part of that whole value chain. And that's where also businesses can play a big role in participating in that. Thank you very much, John. Thank you. I know that we're trying to pack a whole lot into a very short period of time, but 
these are valuable contributions, and I appreciate um, all of your thoughts and ideas. I'm going to leave the last, but not the least, question to Ramin. Um, given your background as a senior official at the U.S. Treasury, um, as well as in state, what do you think the United States, or, or how do you see the the United States' role in terms of how it expects MDVs to reform in the context of supporting African leaders in their work of reaching food sovereignty. What is it that you see? Well, we've heard uh, from numerous speakers, uh, including uh, the Madam President of Ethiopia, the importance of the finance angle. Uh, that we need to mobilize financing for these initiatives to support agricultural systems. And the reform of the multilateral development banks, the evolution of their mission, and the expansion of their ability to provide fin financing is really critical to that. We just had the uh, annual meetings of the IMF and World Bank in Marrakesh, Morocco, uh, which I attended. The U.S. delegation was led by Secretary of the Treasury Yellen. And some concrete progress was made at the Marrakesh meetings, uh, in particular in, in evolving the mission of the World Bank. Uh, the new president of the World Bank, Ajay Bunga, uh, had proposed and got approval for an expansion of the mission. Uh, previously was to end poverty, now it's to end poverty on a livable planet recognizing that the challenges of climate change, of conflict, of food insecurity need to be incorporated into how the World Bank addresses uh, the, uh, its engagement with developing countries, that that's infused in the strategy and, uh, and the programs of the World Bank. So that's uh, one, for one element of it. And as a part of that, President Bunga emphasized in, in the meetings the importance of speeding up the execution of the World Bank's projects. The second dimension, which was, which was endorsed in Marrakesh, was, were some uh, financial reforms that are going to expand the financial firepower of the World Bank. Uh, in particular, a framework for countries, uh, shareholders of the World Bank to provide guarantees that would enable the World Bank to do additional lending or invest in hybrid capital. So just to give you an example, uh, the United States and the Biden administration has asked our Congress for authority for guarantees that would expand the World Bank's lending capacity by $25 billion. Um, and when we add that up, with the approval that was done in the spring uh, of uh, changes in the capital adequacy ratio, plus what we expect other donors to also do, we can expand this financial capacity by up to $200 billion, uh, which is really critical to meeting not only the challenges in the agricultural sector, but the variety of challenges that the developing world is facing. Uh, which are only amplified by the uh, impacts of climate cha change. So there's a long way to go, but one, one of my key impressions from the meetings in Marrakesh was a lot of appreciation uh, among the World Bank shareholders, including those in the developing world, for the leadership and energy of the new World Bank uh, president uh, to bringing about these, uh, these changes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to every member of the panel. Uh, Africa's needs are great. The population is growing exponentially. The future, again, is bright. A lot of excitement here. And I'd like to end with these words. If not now, when? If not you, who? Somebody will move. But I just want to thank every single one of you for all that you're doing to make a difference in our world. It really has been a truly uh, exciting time here. I hope you've enjoyed this plenary discussion. I'd like to say a big thank you to our excellencies, to you, our distinguished guests, to our wonderful panelists um, here at the Norman Bollock Dialogue at the World Food Prize. What an excellent event it truly has been. Once again, I'd like to say a big thank you to President Sally Wok Suedi of Ethiopia and Vice President Kashim Shetima for joining us and providing clarity and thought during our firesides. And Dr. Adishna, thank you very much for superb fireside moderation. <laughs> there he is. Well, we'd also like to say, with that shout from Ambassador Quinn, certainly we're not going to forget the World Food Prize Foundation for providing a wonderful platform to bring this excellent 
plenary together and for giving us the opportunity to share the gains from Dakar to here in Des Moines. And to the many who've worked tirelessly behind the scenes in the offices, at the foundation, the tech team in the back, thank you very much for the wonderful work that you've done and the support that you've given. My name is Victor Ladukun, and it's been my pleasure moderating and emceeing this event. Have a wonderful afternoon, and thank you very much. Thank you.